Hi everyone, we will be starting. Um, so if you want to grab a chair and sort of get ready for this amazing panel. So my name is Adela Goberna. I work at the Latin American, Associ Latin American Internet Association. So on behalf of ALAI, I would like to greet you all and welcome you to this panel named Challenges and Opportunities, How Will Technology Reshape Jobs? So today what we're trying to tackle is how technology will have an impact in jobs. But you know, when we talk about the future of work, lots of perspectives and a lot of negativity comes into the table. And what we're looking for is sort of changing that perspective and sort of understanding how we can use technology on our behalf and sort of create quality work, quality job, and have an impact in productivity. And also tackling other areas like capacity building and digital economy and those kind of uh, perspective that we actually talk about in the whole forum. So having this in mind, um, I would like to introduce our panelists. We'll have two uh, in-present panelists and one remote panelist that unfortunately, unfortunately she couldn't do the trip, but she's here. So I will start with Ana Vasco, who will be joining us remotely. Um, so Ana Inés Vasco is an integration specialist at the Institute for the Integration of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a unit of integration and trade of the Inter-American Development Bank. So Anna, um, she will be having a presentation and I have two questions for you that um, I would like you to sort of give us some insight on it. And the first one is, what are the skills that will be more in demand in the next few years and how Latin American people feel with the digital transformation? Yes, Anna. Sorry, Anna, I don't mean to interrupt you, but could you speak a little bit louder, please? Just a bit.
Actually, more than 100,000 jobs will be created in the area of big data in 2020. But the number of graduates in these studies have been reduced in the last uh, few years. So it seems to be a gap between supply and demand of these kind of skills. And this is something that is also happening in other parts of the world, for example, in Argentina. As a consequence of this, uh, at Intel, and with the support of Ally and Google, we are developing a paper to measure this gap in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Chile. Next one, please. We also observed in this survey that we conducted in Argentina that only three out of three or out of ten people who have STEM skills are women. Only uh, uh, three out of ten. But the good news is that companies that have a higher share of women and more their STEM employees use more technological advances, uh, more advanced technologies. Next one, please. We also observed in the survey that we conducted in a Latinobarometer in 18 different countries to more than 20,000 people, uh, and which constitutes the most important public opinion data bank in Spanish. We uh, observed that Latin American people are afraid of losing their jobs because of this, uh, because of the robots. We asked them if they think that their own uh, job will be replaced by job robots in the next 10 years, and we found that. Uh, more than 45% of Latin Americans agree with this statement. And we also observed that the better the economic situation, the lower the belief that robots will replace their jobs. And also we found that people working in the manufacturing area and industry are more afraid of losing their jobs than people uh, who work at the public sector and defense. Next one, please. We also observed this uh, fear related to robots, robots when we asked Latin American people if we need to limit the use of robots, even if this means a reduction in economic growth. 51% of Latin Americans agree with this statement. And next one, please. And we also observed this fear um, when we asked them if they think that robots are a danger to humanity. 36% of Latin Americans agree also with this statement. Next one. And we uh, also find that this fear is related into, uh, uh, this fear also translates into mistrust about using some disruptive technologies, but also uh, you, um, using less disruptive technologies such as online education platforms. We conclude that 72% of Latin Americans wouldn't travel on autonomous vehicles and 47 uh, of Latin Americans wouldn't agree with their children having online education. Next one, please. And in terms of education for the future, we observe that only 22% of Latin Americans think that digital creation skills will be essential for teachers in the following 20 years, and only 20% of Latin Americans think that robots could help teachers in, the, in the, their job. Next one, please. And we think that this fear is also related to income inequality, as we observed in the survey that we conducted in Argentina on millennials. We wanted to do research on them because they were born in the digital area and now they have to face la the labor market in this new area, in this new revolution. So we ask ourselves, are they prepared for this technological change? What skills do they have? Are there gender gaps? Are there gaps among different socioeconomic sectors? Next one, please. And what we found is that although 93% of millennials have mobile phones with internet access, and although 84% have computers with technological devices. Only 20% of millennials use technolo technology to buy, study, or work. And these are in general male and belong to the upper and middle upper socioeconomic sectors. So we observe that polarization is like a constant throughout the surveys. 
young people from lower socioeconomic sectors and women have fewer skills associated with STEM, STEM use fewer technologies, technologies at work, own fewer technological devices, and choose less technological careers. Next one, please. But although Latin Americans are afraid of losing their jobs because of robots, and although they are not willing to incorporate disruptive technologies, and although millennials don't seem to be so technological, we find some positive changes. First of all, we observe that technology, technology appears as a factor of uh, hope. 80% of Latin Americans who in the last 12 months haven't had enough food have a mobile phone, and 32 have a smartphone. So they prefer technology uh, than uh, having food. Next one, please. We also observe that they feel confident about their education. Two out of three believe that they are well prepared for the jobs of the future. And 56% of people with incomplete primary education say they are also prepared for these uh, jobs. Next one, please. And also we found that they have a positive vision related to technology and uh, jobs. Eight out of 10 believe that technology is good for the jobs of the future. Next one. And finally, we observe that they are conscious about the benefits of internet. 65% of Latin Americans think that internet access is important, even more than having basic infrastructure. So just to conclude, I'd like to leave you with uh, two messages. First of all, we think that through international organizations, the public sector, and the academia, we have to continue to develop data and evidence about the implications of these revolutions in order to reduce technological anxiety and spread the benefits of new technologies. And second, we think that this uh, technological tsunami could be accompanied by more employment, more equality, and more development. And not only in the developed world, but also in developing countries. So we think that this is possible, this dream is possible. And as Latin American countries, we think that we need a regional agenda, an agenda that puts attention on the risk of this revolution, but mainly focuses on the benefits of new technologies to improve lives. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Anna, for your presentation. And this was really interesting because we got the chance to actually see how technology is impacting jobs and how millennials in Latin America are actually seeing technology as an opportunity to sort of tackle the future of jobs. So thanks a lot for bringing the Latin American perspective into the table. And right now, I would like to um, give the floor to Marit Palorvida. She's a senior manager, regional affairs Europe at the Internet Society. And so, Marit, um, last year I saw commissioned a paper called The Internet and Jobs, A Giant Opportunity for Europe. You know, and in this paper they sort of address how the internet economy at the moment, sort of related with the sharing economy and e-commerce, e it's impacting the job creation and the phenomena around it. So, what do you see the opportunities for job creation in the internet economy are, and what are the ISOC's perspective around this, this issue? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so just to maybe give you a bit of background on, on the paper, this was not an Internet Society paper as such. Um, but in Europe, um, I'm based in Brussels. As you know, that there are lots of um, currently kind of negativity around the Internet. So there's a lot of issues that people are concerned with. We're talking about privacy and all these things. And what we wanted to do is to remind really people about the Internet of Opportunity, so that Internet offers opportunity both economically and socially. And hence we commissioned a Brussels-based think tank, SEPS, some of you might know it, Center for uh, European uh, Policy Studies, I think they're called, to write this paper for us as a kind of discussion starter. Um, so it's not directly reflecting uh, Internet Society's positions, but we wanted to bring some meat into the discussions around how the Internet can enable, well, economic growth, but also then job creation. So where are uh, the new jobs then being created uh, in an Internet economy? And I'm just going to give you some examples here, um, in no particular order uh, of priority in any way. But first thing that we looked at uh, is e-commerce. 
So we know that there has been a transition from a kind of a traditional retail sector, uh, from high streets, actual physical shops, to online shopping. And in Europe already, where we have internet access uh, available more or less universally, of course, um, I don't know the exact percentage, but a good part of the people uh, are using already online shopping uh, regularly. So this means, of course, then that there has been a reduction in, in employment opportunities in traditional retail sector, so in shops. But on one hand, and, and there was back in some years ago a discussion about this, that e-commerce is destroying jobs uh, in the traditional retail sector. But of course, since then we have uh, found out that, for example, well, some of the bigger uh, retail, online retailers, Amazon, etc., that there are other jobs that are being created. And as you alluded to before, that these are not only tech technical jobs uh, related to the online platform, but also, for example, in the case of Amazon, they're building now warehouses because they need certain logistics to ship uh, goods around when people are ordering them. So um, they're building warehouses, which typically are located in uh, areas where land is cheap, there are some good transport links, um, and essentially they're creating jobs in areas that are not typically tech hubs. So the jobs may not be the kind of highly skilled IT jobs, but there are good jobs being created uh, for, for other kinds of uh, uh, employment groups. So, um, and, and in this context as well, artificial intelligence, for example, plays a role. So in, in some of these warehouses, they have robots now shifting, uh, shifting uh, goods around, uh, but the robots are not reducing the jobs as such. They're re simply supporting the job roles by taking some other kind of, you know, heavy tasks that human would find difficult or even dangerous to do. So e-commerce is one thing that uh, we have looked at. And if you look at the study, there are some numbers based on uh, a case study from the US. Uh, it's already a bit old, so I'm not gonna quote the numbers in, in this context. The second thing that we looked at is data centers. So as you know, the more traffic we have going online, the more uh, data needs to be stored. And in Europe, for example, uh, well, we have fairly open borders, so we have data traveling, of course, uh, across borders. and there has been a kind of proliferation of establish establishment of large data centers. And I myself, I come from Finland. So this is something that, for example, Finland and Sweden have taken as a kind of national priority to try and attract data centers to come and uh, be established in the countries. And again, the kind of environment that the likes of the Google and the big cloud, cloud uh, service operators who run these data centers and who need to store data, they need typically, you know, cheap land, big areas, good energy, uh, good transport links, some water to cool the data centers, etc. So these are the kind of things that countries, when they start thinking about how do we create employment and attract investment as well, uh, how do we, you know, create an environment that would be attractive to, to data centers, for example. In this case, we found, for example, that Google has a big data center in Finland, that the actual data center after the construction phase it didn't employ, it only employs about 125 people, all in all, but in the construction phase, and in terms of the indirect impact in this particular small town in Eastern Finland, which has been suffering from a kind of industrial uh, transformation, uh, it has, a, has had a very positive impact. Um, so again, uh, indirectly, uh, technology has then created new opportunities in this region, which, which is, not perhaps the most um, advanced in, in, in Finland. The third thing I would like to talk about is sh sharing economy. So we all, well, maybe not all, but many of us use Uber, many of us use uh, blah blah car or cleaning services online, etc. And um, I think this so-called Uberization has opened certain jobs, uh, not again technical jobs, but has opened jobs, for example, if we take the taxi drivers, to uh, groups of people who have been perhaps disadvantaged or in unemployment, and the barriers to join, for example, in this case, Uber or these services is much lower than to join other kinds of highly skilled job. So there's a case study again that we looked at, um, which is actually made based here in Paris, where they found out that Uber has created a lot of jobs around kind of uh, marginalized communities and has really, uh, well, boosted the job market for, for these kinds of um, uh, individuals who, for example, have been struggling with uh, unemployment. 
And um, so again, while the job, jobs created may not be the kind of traditional jobs that we're used to in Europe, meaning high social security, uh, job safety, etc., cetera, um, it is still important that these jobs are opening. And in fact, some of the um, taxi drivers that have been, or the Uber, Uber drivers that have been interviewed really appreciate this flexibility and the fact that they're independent, so they can even have a second job on the side and they can decide when they earn and what they earn. So again, that's a different dynamic to, to the sharing economy has brought a different dynamic to what we're used to really. And the fourth thing that we looked at is then startups and the whole app economy. So um, we all have our smartphones and devices and we're using social platforms and uh, we're using apps of course and downloading apps in, in regard to this. Um, and Europe, in fact, has been very uh, competitive and good in uh, creating tech hubs where you, where you have app developers uh, coming together. Um, and in terms of job creation, actually, Europe is doing, uh, is at the same level, more or less, as the US, which can be surprising because we're always talking about the Silicon Valley and uh, Europe <laughs> lagging behind. But in this sector, Europe is doing, actually, is on a par in terms of jobs uh, being created. So in Europe, just to quote some numbers, um, it's about 1.5 million jobs in related directly to uh, app economy. And then in the US is more, more or less the same, I think 100,000 more jobs. Um, so, so this is a, well, important uh, employment element um, in, in terms of the growth and, and innovation. And then if we look at the countries, to what extent apps, for example, contribute to a country's economy, they talk about something that they call app intensity, which is the percentage of the total jobs related to app development. So Finland is leading this uh, uh, globally, actually 1.9% of all jobs are related to app, app development. In the US is 1.2%. Italy is lagging behind. I just randomly <laughs> picked it at 0.4%. Um, so, so we have great differences between countries. Uh, not all countries are uh, benefiting equally. Um, but, but these are the kind of opportunities I think that countries and regions need to look at if they want to create uh, jobs um, using the internet as a platform. So <coughs> the paper doesn't necessarily uh, address the issue of artificial intelligence. As I said, the, we prepared the paper a year ago already. Uh, but there have been some very uh, in interesting developments and work done in Europe in the area of artificial intelligence since. And uh, we as Internet Society, we're of course following this. We haven't gone into detail uh, in, in looking at the job aspects, but the OECD, for example, has done some work in this. And what is quite interesting that uh, the estimates are that, well, there's only quite a small number of jobs. So they're talking about 5% of jobs that might be destructed because of auto um, things getting automatic and, and uh, robotics, etc. But then there's a much larger part of jobs that will be impacted partially. So the, while the job may not disappear, the job description or the tasks are changing. So we go into the point of the first speaker who was um, talking about reskilling, education playing a key role. So we really need to focus on those aspects because we need to have the people adapting to the new realities and, and uh, changing um, alongside that. And again, I think overall, when we talk about this, um, so all these kind of trends and, and dynamics that we're seeing uh, happening, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, they're not going to be equally uh, spread across the globe. So some countries are better uh, prepared for the transition. Um, and again, this tends to be countries who are already benefiting from the knowledge economy, so well-to-do countries who are used to innovating, etc., and where the workforce is is, is highly educated, whereas countries where you perhaps have manufacturing, etc., is then they are more at risk uh, to suffer from from the changes to come. What is also quite interesting that the OECD uh, report from this year actually points out that the youth may be at the biggest risk, and why is that? Because the young people typically, of course, they are at the bottom of the career ladder, so they might be doing those jobs which include repetition, kind of monotonous tasks, etc. So I think also it's very important to look at how that we're not punishing the youth uh, in the, this kind of technical um, 
progress that we are uh, experiencing here. So I think I will leave my uh, opening remarks there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Marie. That was really interesting to have the European perspective of how this huge topic is changing and that inside country to country and how different policies can actually um, make companies do the investment to sort of create new sort of jobs in different areas. So right now I will give the word to David Storti. Uh, he's a program specialist at the section for ICT, Education, Scientist, Science and Culture at the UNESCO. So David, um, what are in the 20th century the digital skills and how are these leading to employment and digital citizenship? And digital goes fast, education goes slow. How should policy tackle the issues and prepare the next generation? And I think this is really connected with what Marie Chet said and what the first, the previous speaker said about how we are preparing millennials to sort of uh, make the most of the opportunities that they will be given. So the floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I work at, uh, uh, here at UNESCO in the communication information sector and uh, which is dealing with the wide range of issues. And one of the issues is about uh, what we call the uh, knowledge societies which is uh, basically the, it's a, the evolution from the, what was called the information society and how this information transformed into the knowledge. And, uh, and uh, the work we do here is uh, exactly to um, uh, see how, from a society point of view, are we prepared for this uh, um, shift to the, the, what we call the knowledge societies. So, um, I think it's uh, um, the angle that uh, we uh, work on, more, more on the pure angle of uh, jobs, let's say. But uh, the idea is uh, exactly to um, uh, look at uh, how um, we as a citizens are um, prepared, as uh, was said by Anna, to this uh, um, sh shift, which is a different shift in, in different uh, places. So where in some, in some areas it's a real transition because you have a very well established uh, uh, job market uh, and then you have to, to, to shift towards this uh, digital uh, revolution with the AI and uh, all these things. In other area of the world it's, uh, it's a different kind of shi shift because you have a, uh, a population which is maybe even much younger and, this, uh, and they are, um, let's say, uh, uh, naturally uh, taking this uh, uh, new form of jobs and taking the, um, the confidence in using the technology for, for uh, um, you know, uh, creating their own future. So what is uh, important here is how the, um, I mean from our perspective is the, um, how, how we prepare this uh, techno sapiens uh, uh, kind of uh, human being that was mentioned. Uh, so uh, we, uh, have to um, get into a new kind of skills. So these famous 21st century skills is, are, are skills that are certainly um, soft and uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you know, young people must be prepared. Not, and when I say young, it's uh, you know, even until 30, 35, et cetera. Uh, we prepared to um, let's say, uh, um, have, uh, understand the world, the digital world they're living in, which means that uh, uh, how do you, um, what is your approach towards these changes? And we see the slides where people are a bit sort of fear, de develop a sort of fear against uh, new technology, although they, ha they are in majority using uh, one, two, three phones every day, uh, this, this uh, development of this fear is because we, I mean, there's a general, misunderstanding of what's going on on the other side of the machine. So this is uh, where uh, we are developing some programs here at UNESCO uh, where we join other people's uh, efforts. So one, there's one project in particular I would like to mention. It's called uh, Youth Mobile, which is uh, uh, providing young people with the skills and the confidence to understand this kind of technology and be prepared to, to see, okay, uh, when I click something on uh, my Facebook because I'm uh, discussing with someone behind there is a whole world that is uh, unveiling, which is made of data, is made, made of uh, 
uh, data flows. Uh, and there are uh, options and opportunities which has been have been developed by someone that are giving us the opportunity to maybe discuss with someone or maybe to uh, expose our uh, curriculum to other people, like in uh, some social networks. So being uh, able to understand these things it becomes uh, effectively uh, important in terms of uh, uh, imagining new services, like uh, you mentioned the Uberization uh, model, because uh, nowadays, yes, we explore a moment where uh, there is the uh, largest uh, uh, hotel, uh, no, not hotel, in the largest uh, um, um, hotel kind of uh, service in the world, uh, having no hotels room as an owner. As Uber is the same, it's the largest probably company of taxi in the world, they don't own a, a single taxi. So this is are all things made by people that are uh, and fully understanding how this uh, digital economy works and how they can uh, imagine new services built on it. So it's quite important from an education point of view to give uh, everyone the uh, opportunity to uh, be part of it and not just, uh, um, let's say, um, being uh, users of uh, what other people are, are choosing, but uh, in, a, in a world which is a highly uh, in some, some regions of the world, uh, this is uh, uh, the largest population is uh, the youth, and this uh, youth has to be uh, uh, skilled. So you mentioned also, the, uh, for example, the, um, the app economy. Uh, this is uh, totally related. So how do you um, uh, reinforce the effort of these uh, um, apps? In, in uh, Africa, for example, there is a huge network of uh, uh, hubs that are uh, supporting this kind of development. And, uh, and there you have then uh, the, some challenges, of course, uh, like uh, um, the app uh, pl distribution platforms, for example, that uh, are, you know, um, I mean, if you do a fantastic app because you have been, you have the skill, the et cetera, it's very hard to get it uh, up there in the top 10 of uh, any uh, app, uh, app uh, market uh, that you are available. So that's also poses policy challenges of uh, how this uh, new economy is open to, uh, uh, you know, new new actors, a new market. Uh, it was I think was mentioned by President Macron yesterday in his speech as well. Um, and certainly, um, uh, yeah, I mean there are, there are certainly different kind of uh, jobs. And here, uh, yes, there is a huge risk of uh, inequality and polarization of jobs because uh, uh, many of these uh, uh, new economy job market is uh, actually opening up jobs which are. Uh, yes, maybe um, um, filling a, a some immediate needs, but uh, I think it's not uh, very well clear yet what are the consequences in, in uh, longer term, uh, especially for societies that are built on, uh, uh, you know, some uh, um, uh, jo job framework uh, with social security and other things that you also mentioned. So. Uh, on the other side, then you have a, a, a growing um, pool of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of young people and uh, that are if supported by uh, adequate policies and also investments, they may actually uh, uh, start to propose a, a new, um, uh, new sort of solutions and, and jobs. But that's... Uh, that's, uh, um, of course, a matter of investment. There are many countries that uh, have been, uh, uh, are trying now to prepare for this, but there is uh, still a huge uh, gap in terms of uh, the offering of uh, education in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and this is a bit uh, where, uh <coughs> where we do work, actually, here uh, at UNESCO. So I think, um, um, there is also uh, another point uh, on, uh, in terms of the, uh, how the, these policies that are in including these kind of skills in the education systems are also uh, very different in nature. There are more and more countries, especially particularly in Europe, uh, there are more and more countries that are proposing this kind of uh, um, skill education in schools, um, referring, for example, about uh, coding skills. Um, but this, this is uh, done in a very different ways, and uh, I feel, uh, as I was uh, talking to you, I, was, I feel that this is not done always uh, with the same uh, objective. So sometimes the objective 
of uh, giving this kind of education is not uh, uh, clear. Uh, the expectation should not necessarily be to create a new army of uh, uh, software engineers, but uh, rather to create a, uh, uh, to give skills to citizens so they can fully participate in the digital economy and digital society and be part of in creating these uh, uh, new opportunities uh, uh, that uh, may arise. So I think uh, maybe for the opening, I leave it. Yeah, you can. Perfect. Thanks a lot, David, for your intervention. And right now, I would like to ask uh, you guys if you actually have a question or some remarks you would like to address to the panelists. Anna is also online, so she can also reply in case anyone has a question or so. So over there, and then we go over there. Thanks. Yeah, um, coming from San Francisco, the effect of Uber uh, has been dramatic for working people. First of all, it's m marginalized workers who can't get decent jobs. Many of these workers spend 12, 15 hours in their car. Some have committed suicide. It's creating a, a very bad situation for the working class. Um, and these platforms have made a lot of money. The wealth has gone to the owners of these platforms, not to the working class. Um, and uh, in, devel in developing economies, uh, these big corporations uh, have micro workers working in small parts. Uh, they expect to get computer training. They're not getting computer training. They're getting little bits of it. So as, when you have monopoly control of these media monopolies or these tech companies, they're going to exploit the working class the best way that they can. And basically, you have a greater disparity of wealth developing in the advanced countries and in developing countries. So I don't see the future as promising under the present structure of development in uh, the world economy with, uh, with the control, monopoly control really, of, of tech in, uh, in the United States and internationally. Well, maybe just to say, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, there are issues. I mean, we're not trying to portray a kind of a dream world. I mean, that's, that's uh, not the case. And this is actually something, uh, the market consolidation, as, as we call it globally, uh, this is something that the Internet Society is currently doing uh, um, some research on. So you may know that we every year publish a global internet report. Um, and this year's report will be exactly on that. Market consolidation, internet market consolidation, what are the impacts wanted, unwanted, etc. This will be published in January. So um, I'm not in a position to, to share <laughs> any conclusions at this stage. But I think what you're saying is, is uh, true. Uh, the fact that the internet companies are so large and consolidated, that is directly driving not only the things that you said, but the job market uh, globally. And for example, when we talk about automatization, you know, if, if a large company decides to automate certain function or, you know, at their facility in whatever country, that will have a dramatic impact, of course, simply because uh, these are massive employers and, and so forth and have large ecosystems around them as well, uh, indirectly. So uh, not disputing any of that. Um, thanks for your comment. Uh, yeah, it's a, a, a huge problem. I think uh, also um, that uh, highlights also the may remember the discussion about um, the um, neutrality also that's uh, also coming into uh, the picture because uh, in uh, depends on the settings that we are operating in or I mean companies or everybody is operating in uh, the emergence th this kind of uh, issue may only probably be tackled by uh, uh, f favoring let's say the emergence of new actors that may, that may uh, let's say, uh, provide some alternatives. And uh, we have seen also in Europe here, there is a, uh, there have been a lot of uh, discussions around uh, the um, strong actors from the, from the internet and uh, how the uh, local or, or standard, let's say, uh, traditional way of doing this kind of business has been uh, reacting by opening uh, new, s new services for them so that to change the way they were operating before, so to provide sort of alternatives for the uh, employer, empl employees that were uh, already, already there. So I think what is uh, uh, the problem is that, that the, um, yeah, there is a, 
there are risks and uh, there are a um, um, lot to be done, I think, in, in ensuring there is a diversity of, of offer that is uh, uh, maybe uh, avoiding uh, this kind of uh, uh, polarization of, of the work, which, which, which uh, is at the, at the end of the day the negative because also the uh, uh, you know, jobs that may disappear very quickly, and uh, including, uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, you mentioned it, uh, the um, uh, warehouses, et cetera. This, yeah, that, that's also a problem. You know, these uh, things could pop up uh, uh, quickly, but they also can disappear quite quickly if uh, that's not, uh, you know, relevant anymore. So, Thanks a lot for the question and for the answers. Um, I think we got a question over there. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, making the point. I was uh, about to talk exactly in the same way as you did, so thank you for your remarks. I'm coming from Argentina, and there, there's a, a trend on precarization uh, because of this new app uh, business businesses. And I'd like to share what is happening there uh, especially with the people that are migrants from Venezuela, especially there's lots of people from Venezuela working in Argentina, and as their legal status is yet not uh, uh, clear, uh, they, they tend to work in these uh, delivery uh, services platforms. But the, there is something uh, interesting happening there that, that I'd like to share with you, is that there is now the the project of building a union of these uh, from that that comes from these workers and i'd like to ask you if there is any other experience expertise in in, in the rest of the world of these people uh, starting their own union because they also don't feel protected by uh, other workers unions for example you mentioned the uh, uber drivers cases in argentina they are uh, there is a big fight against Uber drivers that comes from taxi drivers. And the taxi drivers union is not containing them as colleague workers, but they are rejecting them. And there is a, a, a big problem there because they are also workers. Uh, beyond the narrative that they are members of the business or that they are partners of the business, in fact, they are workers. And in fact, this kind of, of new uh, works are the most precarized works, uh, jobs. So I think this idea of getting their own union is something that is interesting to, to, to watch and to pay attention to. And I'd like to ask the panel if there, is, uh, if there are other experiences in the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your question. Um, we'll be, would you like guys, would you like to reply to her, or should I pick up some? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, so the lady in the green coat, please. Um, Helani Galpaya from Learn Asia, working in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, I think the, uh, for a lot of certainly South Asian and Southeast Asian, the poorer countries, the picture is sort of in between what you say. While what the gentleman said about precarious work, that is certainly true. Um, but this exists in the context often of no other work, right? I mean, we shouldn't imagine for a lot of people in developing countries that this is some amazing utopia, non-digital work. They don't have labor rights. They have precarious employment. They are at the mercy of their employers. So it's not that we've moved them to an amazing good economy, but they've actually moved to an economy where they're slightly more formalized, they're slightly maybe better recourse, depending on the platform that you're working on. Uh, you might be able to prove your income in certain ways. So I think the picture is a lot more nuanced. It's not as dire as it is. It's not as amazing as it is either. And often uh, the flexibility it offers is what allows uh, gender non-binary people to enter the workforce because they're not being judged on what they are because they're doing remote work. It's what's allowing women with very low skills to even do the worst kind of work like ad clicking online from home. Uh, and these are not without dangers because platforms play them out of their money. Uh, there's no offline really. I mean, a lot of these things just like non-digital labor can be improved 
with proper mechanisms for redressal, proper labor laws, a lot more unionization for which on platforms there's very low incentives and that's a real problem. As the, uh, the speaker was saying, I think there's a lot more nuance to the debate than the extremes that are sort of, you know, being artificially imposed on this, I think. Thanks a lot for your comment. Uh, I think we got two questions over there, um, three questions, okay. Uh, so the lady, please. I wanted to also refer to some research that's done across the Global South, this after access research. Um, there's a small component on that, on, on micro work. And it is quite, I mean, there's similarities and there are differences across the regions that are enormous. And there's similarities and differences within countries which are quite enormous. I suppose that speaking from the African research um, perspective, um, the main point is how limited this work actually is. Although it's presented as a, you know, a, a, an option for people, actually very, very few people are doing this work actually. And um, the significant thing or the character thing that characterizes the research in Africa is that a lot of people are doing um, manual work, continuing to do manual work off a digital platform. So the allocation of work and assignment of work is off a digital platform, but they're continuing in large numbers to do um, you know, washing, gardening, and, and cab hailing. Um, so the very small number of people actually doing the sort of micro work. And what is interesting about the data is that it does demonstrate that, you know, offline patterns of exploitation, et cetera, happen between North and South with contractors, um, even in the uh, Latin American can, um, um, data with the um, French, you know, uh, Spanish speaking people in Latin America being, um, you know, marginalized compared to the um, Spanish platforms that they're working on. So there's a lot of the traditional um, uh, inequalities and, and um, you know, a, a mirroring of, of, of the inequalities and exploitation. But they're also, um, in the interviews that we've done, um, an enormous opportunity for people. So um, as uh, Hilani was saying, for a lot of people, this means actually not working in the case of Uber or Taxify for a very exploitative taxi company that in very often in many of our jurisdictions is highly corrupt, gangsterized kind of business. Um, even though people might be organized, um, it's under very stringent kind of conditions. And we are seeing in um, South Africa, for example, um, Uber organizers and taxify, or, um, taxify drivers organizing themselves and demanding to be allowed to, or, to, to organize, getting effective responses from platforms, not effective, getting responses from platforms in terms of crime and uh, protection from in crime and the fees that they're taking. So there is, when, when you've got actual manual labor that's happening off a digital, you can, there are people that can be organized and make, you know, you can meet with them, which is slightly different from other, some of the other things. So one last point just to, to add to that is that um, there are um, initiatives to try and, um, you know, get labor standards applied, international, you know, ILO standards applied, basic um, labor rights applied to platforms. And there's an initiative that we um, are working with the Oxford Internet Institute called the Fair Work Foundation. And the uh, effort there is to try and get platforms to um, agree to a set of the basic principles and then for it to be, um, you know, to be recognized on their site and therefore in their negotiations around governance and various other things that they are trying to um, improve the way they're perceived, they could get some sort of accreditation if they were allowing people to organize, if they were paying a minimum wage, if they were, you know, those kinds of things. Thanks a lot for your intervention. Uh, the gentleman over there. Uh, Atif, uh, my name is Atif. I'm from the government of Pakistan, uh, the Ministry of IT. Uh, we have, uh, in the last few years, been focusing on incubators, and we are trying to get startups to, you know, we're guiding them to start their own businesses. And it's something that's been very successful in Pakistan. One of the key things that we focus on is uh, coming up with something that is individual, that is unique, and that is localized, that's small, that's not, you know, based on a brand. Focusing on the topic that we have, the future of jobs, essentially what we preach to our, you know, startups is that, you know, you, uh, for example, we have a startup from a very remote area of Pakistan that's basically working on copper uh, plates and they're like really beautifully designed. Uh, but then again, as we move towards uh, e-commerce, future where you won't really have to go to a marketplace to buy stuff. 
there is this, uh, you know, feeling, uh, I, I feel this is, I think, more specific to South Asia. I don't think, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of that in, uh, in my little experience of uh, the West. We like to hold things and make sure that, like it's good quality, what I'm holding in my hand. Either that, or it has to be like an established brand. You know, I'm buying a Mac. I know what a Mac is. I know what a, an HP laptop is. But when I'm buying something individual and unique, I have to hold it in my hand. So like when we move towards from physical marketplaces to a future where there is, will, no be, will not be a physical marketplace and I'm buying things online, do you see the death of individual, you know, uh, products launched by small startups and small artists? Do you see the death of that in, as a future? Should they conform with, you know, big multinational companies and, you know, brands? How will they survive? Um, the you over there, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I just wanted to say, I think I completely agree with the point that Helani made about the fact that when we look at global South context, I think it's really important to have a lot of nuance. Um, but I was also wondering, because I think a lot of the research that was presented here is talking about um, where and how automation and probably techno technologies such as AI are affecting jobs. But in the context of um, countries like India, where we don't have jobs, but we have livelihoods, and you know there are jobs that are in the informal sector and don't even get counted in the first place, I wonder what mechanisms are there to sort of think about the ways in which automation is also uh, very much, not just automation, but I think large digital processes such as platformization, gig work, the breakdown of traditional employment contracts as we're seeing it with like absolutely no worker protections, complete evacuation of collecting bargaining rights, everything happening. How do we sort of also confront that reality that there's a sector that's not even in the reckoning, which is very much getting squeezed? And in that context, I also wanted to connect it to the question of reskilling, which I think is very, very important. What do you do um, with this sector of uh, people, marginal producers, traders, etc., who are just trying to get by, who are getting completely co-opted into platforms, um, not on terms that are to their liking or you know anything which gives them a certain amount of bargaining power? Because um, for a long time now, I think reskilling has also stagnated. Uh, we're not talking about higher order skills. We're not talking about actually um, equipping people to deal with the new paradigms. What we're doing is, um, like the point that was made earlier, a little bit of technology that helps me get this job done and helps me um, sort of integrate into that value chain of the big platform. So how do we sort of you know, confront those problems, I guess? Because we're thinking about like extremely skilled workforces in India, which 4% um, of all of our engineers actually have the capability to start you know, venturing into AI and those kinds of things. So that's highly skilled, white collar people who are worried about their jobs, then what do we do about them? So that's, I guess, my question slash comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions and your remarks. Over there, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Talcher. I'm from the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva. Uh, I have a question concerning the topic of skills, um, which is very important when we talk about the future of jobs. And first of all, thank you very much to the panelists for the very good uh, contributions and interesting uh, uh, topics. When we uh, talk about uh, the future of the jobs, we hear a lot about what kind of skills are needed. And we heard again, I think, in some of the presentations today that there is an increase in the demand of people having soft skills. So my question is around the topic of, of soft skills. And in fact, sometimes um, soft skill demand is even higher than demand in other skills, um, as being reported from the side of employers. And I would like to hear from the panelists um, whether they would agree to these kind of um, uh, findings that often come from surveys, company surveys, uh, when it comes to soft skill requirements, and what that means in terms of taking action on it. So if we talk about uh, creating employment uh, for young people, and these kind of soft skills are in high demand, what does that mean? Uh, who has to take action on that? Is it in the education sector? At what level? And for me, sometimes that's something that is not so clear yet when we come in to the um, discussion on, on taking action on improving 
those skills. So I, I would like to hear from the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. I don't know if anyone else would like to address something. Okay, one last question over there, and I'll just give the floor to the panelists to sort of reply to all of this information that's going on here, you know? Okay, well, I hope they're taking notes because there's a, a whole bunch of different subjects there on those questions. Um, I, I want to I just kind of open one more, one more frontier for these questions, and that's a lot of this is built on the assumption that the job market will shift, but there will be new jobs for people to have. Um, and I'm not sure that if we're looking in the kind of medium term, whether we can really rely completely on that assumption. Assuming that the technology takes off well and all these processes are automated, it may well be that there's just less labor to be done by human beings. Um, and that means that some of the beginning of the problems that we're seeing in terms of like increased co competition, precarity and so forth, are gonna project into uh, a society where the people that currently have or control uh, the companies are able to generate value without you without without the benefit of labor from other people so that there's no there'll be no more natural redistribution system for for wealth um, and I want, I'm wondering to what extent that kind of scenario is being considered and what could be the preliminary steps to prepare for uh, you know a, a more balanced future in that in that case thank you Thank you very much for your intervention, and I don't know if David or Marid would like to start. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, um, well, thank you for the, the very nice, uh, tough discussion. So maybe, uh, um, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, that's um, no, some, some actually uh, there is a good discussion about uh, you know the future of um, jobs in terms of uh, we will have less labor overall, and then should we be pre kind of prepare the um, you know, uh, countries be prepared to uh, provide uh, different uh, sources of, uh, of revenue, uh, let's say that's uh, yes. But uh, at the same time, you know, I think um, also to link to the uh, other question on soft skills, I think um, um, what, uh, I think the education sector has a lot of, of to play in this kind of uh, um, demand because uh, uh, actually, it's not. Uh, uh, it's no longer just um, you know. Education role primarily is to prepare people for the for the future, right? This is the education. Okay, if you go to, uh, for of course, very uh, you know um, precise education, you get uh, some special specialization on some on some particular things. But the overall education uh, is uh, at least the primary secondary education is uh, meant to uh, build the capacity of uh, the the students to. Uh, face the, uh, the, the the future. That's uh, I, th I think the, what is the, should be the primary law of education overall, which is means that uh, in uh, such a, 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 a world with uh, uh, there are some skills like uh, uh, problem solving, for example, uh, like uh, what we, we call uh, this is called, uh, for example, computational thinking, which are kind of skills that ve apply very well to uh, let's say digital world because uh, enable uh, the the student to get a mindset uh, in terms of uh, how to uh, decrypt something which is highly complex and try to uh, find a, uh, somehow a solution for that by maybe uh, dividing the problem in smaller problem, etc. cetera. Um, so all sorts of uh, um, kind of reasoning skills that are providing additional, uh, let's say, um, tools for, for people to um, front this uh, confront this, this, this the, the, some of the problems that we've been discussing now, uh, and uh, and that's uh, also something which is uh, 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 responding to um, yeah the, the idea of reskilling. That's uh, sim something similar as well because uh, uh, yeah reskilling. We, we have done some projects on uh, we, uh, where we we had the um, let's say. Um, so set up sort of uh, trainings for uh, for people that were already in some kind of jobs and uh, through uh, this kind of uh, uh, courses, uh, uh, trying to uh, give them some of these uh, soft skills I just mentioned, but also some uh, also some uh, I mean very much depends on the which kind of population you are talking about. But in these cases where 
uh, also giving some skills about the commerce, about skills about the marketing, so that uh, you are also able to imagine some different kind of future uh, for you. So this is uh, something that uh, there are many associations doing this uh, all over the world. Uh, in France, there are many examples of this. So this is uh, something which is uh, uh, tackled a lot. A lot, and uh, I think the, uh, through the education sector, there is now a number of um, um, offerings, uh, especially, for example, the online offering that. Uh, were not uh, very popular in uh, Latin America, apparently, but <laughs> but uh, we are providing this kind of of, uh, of, um, of, of perspective, and uh, uh, also um, yeah, I mean I've, I'm not uh, that uh, much. Uh, you know, I don't have an answer for the question of, of Pakistan about uh, you know when you like to have something in hand, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we can observe that yes, uh, it's a global market. That things are going. Uh, uh, up and down through uh, uh, you know different kind of uh, post new postal services which are really are, are substituting in some cases the normal uh, services which are offered uh, typically by um, you know, state companies uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, probably the market will just adapt to it uh, uh, offering in those places where people will prefer something there will be some offering that probably pop up so I don't see this as a huge uh, problem in terms of development. Uh, um, in, in terms of uh, um, how these new workers can, uh, let's say, um, reorganize themselves to defend uh, um, some of their rights or at least to uh, um, somehow make sure that they are properly uh, considered by the uh, employer, employer, which is uh, sometimes a huge uh, big company which is as just a name and it's very invisible. Um, well, that's uh, an issue. I don't think we have a position uh, here uh, at UNESCO on this, but uh, um, there, there have been, uh, uh, um, yeah, there, there is, there is a, uh, actually a very uh, huge difference. From uh, one hand, uh, people feeling oppressed uh, in, one, in one place, and uh, we heard about uh, uh, the, te the testimony of, uh, of this kind of uh, new um, uh, settings providing also uh, new possibilities because of people that were not able to uh, have a jobs before. So I think uh, that's a very new. Uh, I think there is a, um, probably um, a huge role that to be played by states to make sure that there is uh, somehow uh, you know, some way to go about, uh, about these things. Uh, so we, we should uh, know <laughs> see a little bit, but uh, these are certainly problems that uh, are um, usually important uh, when you talk about uh, this new new kind of uh, market. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a very uh, rich menu of uh, topics. Um, but maybe going, uh, starting from your uh, question about the job descriptions and uh, destruction on jobs maybe not being naturally replaced, etc. that there will be a kind of deficiency. Um, I think, I think, it I mean, we haven't actually addressed the question who, who should take action. You refer to it a bit that states, governments will play a big role. So, for example, when we look at these transitions, in we already kind of uh, understand from the discussion here that globally we have very different situations from uh, you know, the developing world from very kind of innovative, highly developed countries that use internet across the board. So, you know, who should, who should be the one, uh, you know, creating the, the, the security net and, and the plan going forward? So I do think that, of course, governments are in a very crucial situation, but that doesn't really solve the problem because we know that in some parts of the world, governments are much better prepared than in other parts of the world. So that may leave a good part of uh, workers in a disadvantage. Um, I do find some comfort on your um, comment on soft skills because this would seem to imply that if employers are asking for more soft skills, that these are the kind of skills that cannot be replaced easily, right? By uh, robotics, etc. because uh, we still need these kinds of skills for jobs where, which you know, are not replication, etc. And, and you need manage, managerial things, uh, creativity, linked to creativity, etc. So I don't think that there will be, let's say, uh, suddenly not not enough jobs in the digital sector or linked to the digital sector. Um, but I do think that the reallocation, the reskilling, plays a crucial part. 
Um, and I do think also that, well, governments are not only responsible, it's also the employers. So we already talked about the big, large, for example, uh, IT companies, right? Or any other manufacturer company. So the employer is actually responsible partially for their workforce. So if they want to move to the digital age and change their processes, it's also up to them to prepare their workforce. And I think it's their, in their interest to use the people who are already working for them, uh, probably with good results for a certain time, and reskill them um, and prepare them for the digital transformation. So um, I think I would, I would go to those two groups as the key kind of uh, drivers for change. Um, and going then um, to the discussion about the unions and the new jobs being precarious, um, yes, as you say, we're not also, uh, <laughs> you know, um, necessarily um, touching those topics in our daily work. Uh, but I know that in Europe as well, this has been a big discussion. I know in the UK, for example, in London, where you have a lot of, uh, I think they call it the zero hour contracts, you know, contracts whereby you're hired, uh, but they don't actually guarantee you any work per week, so it's just as it comes in. Um, and we've been, I've been following a bit the discussion. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there are some efforts to, I don't know if we can call it unionization yet, but there are some efforts, of course, because part of these workers are not happy with the situation. There is another part who are pleased. You know, there's a lot of students in London, for example, who probably want to have a kind of side job to just make some money on the side. So this may be a nice way to earn some money on the side. But, but then those who, uh, for, for, for whom it's a kind of full-time option, um, you know, that's, of course, not a satisfactory situation. Um, and, well, coming from a part of the world where trade unions are very strong, both in Finland where I'm from and in Belgium where I'm living, I also think that the high level of unionization is not necessarily the ultimate bliss. I mean, we have to live with strikes on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, so there's, there's certain, you know, I think we need to look at a balance there. So it's, it's good to try and perhaps, you know, get this group of workers together and perhaps make a case to the government, for example, to, to impose some guidelines and how this could be done. And I really liked your comment. I didn't know that there was this ILO uh, work being done on, on um, standards for uh, jobs stemming from the online platform. So I think this kind of international, um, you know, voluntary guidelines that can give some ideas for different countries, that would be a very useful way to go forward and also would maybe create a kind of level playing field between the different countries from the very highly developed to the developing world. Um, so I think uh, that that's, uh, that's a very interesting role that international institutions can play in this, in this, uh, in these developments. So thanks a lot. Um, so I think Anna would like to sort of reply to one of the questions. I don't know if we can hook her online. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Anna, we can hear you. Um. Yeah, no, I just wanted to answer uh, the question related to uh, the soft skills. The, I think it was from the, the woman in the uh, telecommunication agency. I, I think that's a um, very good question. Um, I think it's uh, really a very uh, a huge challenge because when we think about soft and hard skills, uh, we, we always think that hard skills are easier to be developed by humans because where well, you can sit down and learn about mathematics, science, big data, etc., and you can learn about it. And related to soft skills, it seems to be more difficult because well, uh, first there seems to be that people, there are people who are more uh, or who have more soft skills like collaboration, uh, creativity, curiosity, uh, and you all, by, we always ask ourselves uh, how, how these skills can be developed, no? Uh, but it seems to be that there is uh, evidence, clear evidence, that these kind of skills can be developed through training, uh, courses, uh, different practices. These skills can be developed even in people who are not collaborative or who are not creative. So, and regarding the, the question, uh, so who is in charge or who, who, who can be responsible for this, I think that it's like a mix, uh, as was mentioned uh, in, the, in the panel. Uh, I think that the, the role of the state is very important, the role of the government. The government 
uh, can be can generate incentives and programs to promote this kind of skills. Uh, but also, of course, the, the employers, the firms, uh, they they have to uh, they they have to they, they have to have a, a very important role here to reskill the, the employers, the employees, and and of course the um, the, the during the academia, the universities. Uh, this kind of uh, program should be uh, included in the in the curricula of universities and and, and well and the different careers. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I think David, you have a reaction over there. Uh, yes, no, thank you, Anna. So, uh, yeah, I think one of the challenges here, uh, talking about uh, this uh, education to this kind of skills, is. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, difference in the speed from uh, you know, all these uh, changes that are occurring in the in technology, in the market, etc., and the slow. You, know, you mentioned this in the question: the, uh, how the education is responding uh, to these uh, challenges. That, of course, are very uh, slow. I mean, because it's uh, it's not easy to change uh, an educational system. It's not easy to uh, uh, change it uh, where w in places where it wor works, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's, to change it in the places where um, it's it's building up and there there is a huge already uh, gap between uh, uh, the offering of education, for example, in the cities or in uh, rural areas, etc. So uh, that's that's the problem. Also, the other problem is that uh, these skills are maybe um, um, uh, now offered in many many countries, but also uh, there are, there are um, let's say. Uh, taken as a separate su subject also, and that's uh, also, I think, uh, what is, uh, has to be changed. Uh, I mean, uh, this kind of skills should be uh, actually more embedded in the overall education and not only uh, relegated as uh, a separate uh, things. because uh, when you want to uh, apply digital uh, uh, skills to, um, to uh, um, Overall, for, for imagining the future, you should uh, try to apply it uh, and not just considering it as, uh, as a separate uh, things. So uh, that's also challenging. I'm not sure how this uh, will be responding, but uh, uh, this is a discussion which is going on. So having that been said, um, I think we're reaching our time to sort of finish the panel. So this was very interesting, as we can tell. There are a lot of subjects going on around the future of work. We got from regulation and policy and public policy and how can we actually tackle the creation of new jobs, technology and non-technology related. From capacity building and how can we use the education sector to sort of empower the new forced labor and so many other circumstances that actually have to have, have a context with the actual context of each, con each country and uh, place in the world, but as we can actually see, it's a, it's a topic that is going to take some time and it's going to take some new perspective to sort of tackle it and have a global solution that has an impact in the regional and in the local level. So thank you very much everybody for being here, for the great questions and remarks, and thanks a lot for our panelists for being here also. Um, see ya. <laughs>